Welcome again, series on the Restoration Era. I just want to do a quick review of what we've already said, and that is that this era takes place after the release of the Jews from Babylonian captivity. The uh, Jewish monarchical lineage started with David, went to Solomon, and then divided into Judah and Israel. Israel's line and nation in the northern kingdom ceased in 722 BC with the fall of Samaria. But faithful Judah in the south, they continued until 586 BC. But there, in spite of many warnings and, and uh, quite, uh, several other deportations which started in 606 BC, Judah did not listen. Their king did not keep his word. King Zedekiah to King Nebuchadnezzar that he would serve him. He rebelled against him. And so in the 11th year of his reign, 586 BC, we find that Nebuchadnezzar came, broke into the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and then from 606 BC is the beginning of the prophecy of the 70 years of captivity in Babylon through Jeremiah the prophet. Now then, before that, Isaiah, that great prophet, who had such an understanding and depth of prophecy, shall I say, who spoke of the coming of the Lord and his life, his crucifixion, also said in Isaiah 44 and verse 28 that the temple would not only be destroyed, the temple of Solomon, but that that temple would be rebuilt by the order of Cyrus, king of Persia. That was 150 years before Cyrus was born. Can we doubt the authenticity of the word of God when we see prophecies like that? And another great prophecy, of course, was the prophecy of a man of God who came to Jeroboam, the first king of the uh, lineage of the kings of Israel in the north came to him and said, you know that upon that altar, that heathen altar that Jeroboam the first son of Nebat had made, that there would arise another king from the lineage of David, Josiah by name, who would burn all the bones of the false priests upon that altar. You know, Can we doubt the authenticity of the word of God that can declare an act of a man 350 years before he's born and give him his name, Josiah? And can we doubt for the purposes of this study on the restoration area, can we doubt, can we possibly doubt that Isaiah can prophesy a name of a king of Persia who will indeed bring down the Babylonian Empire and also give an order to rebuild the temple. Now, consider all these things because, after all, in Isaiah's time, the Babylonian Empire virtually was very small indeed. It was just centered around Babylon. But the prophetic word prevailed. And so we see in a very clear sense that when God speaks, what he says comes to pass. And does it not give us comfort to know that God is in control of all things? You know, very much in control of his people Israel in those days, certainly in control of them today, 
and uh, declaring that the Antichrist must first come before the return of the Lord who shall deliver his people and deliver them from the siege of Jerusalem. All these things we must believe because of this restoration era prophecy. Two very significant prophecies. Number one, that Cyrus, king of Persia, shall give the order to restore the temple, rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. The other one, that the captivity which started in 606 BC would last 70 years, 70 years, and then they would be released. Two prophecies that were fulfilled in the same year, the year 536 BC, when Cyrus ascended the throne and gave the order for the release of the Jews and gave the order to rebuild the temple. Now, if you look at the prophecies in this glorious book, you cannot but doubt that God is in control and what he says will come to pass and think all the things that he said will come to pass soon in our lives too. And also, if God has spoken to you personally, through prophecy, through quickening a word from God or through, into your own heart and giving you promises, if you are faithful and walk uprightly, those things also should be fulfilled. So we are men and women of destiny. Well, I want to come now to the Restoration Era and uh, I want to come to the time of Ezra in the uh, reign of King Ahasuerus. King Ahasuerus. And uh, this king was mightily influenced by two men. Ezra, the teaching priest, and Nehemiah, his cup-bearer. His cup-bearer. When we come to the book of Nehemiah, we shall explain those things. But this king was mightily influenced by those two godly men and possibly from his mother who could have been Queen Esther. Well, we now come to Ezra chapter 7 and uh, we're starting here with verse 23 and we're considering the commandments of the king. Now the king has already given a commandment concerning Ezra that as a teaching priest he is to teach his people the ways of God. But now, a little later on in that chapter, we come to certain things that the king charged Ezra to do. And they are very applicable to our own lives. Because after all, it's not just an academic study of the word of God that we're interested in but truths that will grip and apprehend our own lives. And so here we have in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 23, whatsoever, you know, the Lord has commanded you to do, you are to diligently fulfill. Or in the words of the ancient, whatsoever is diligently commanded by God, do it. Now, this is very important. Ezra knew through study exactly what God wanted him to do. He realized his responsibilities that he had to teach and indeed start up again temple worship. Now, I'm looking at our own lives. And I want to give an illustration from Moses. Moses was shown the pattern of the tabernacle. And he was told, you know, see that you do what was shown to thee. In other words, Moses had a specific revelation from God to build a temple, a tabernacle, a tent 
you know, with the three places, the other court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, and certain vessels to be placed in there. And God said, do all things according to the pattern shown thee. See that you do all things according to the pattern shown thee. The king says to Ezra, be diligent to do all that God has commanded. Now then, the point I want to develop here is this. You know, both Moses and Ezra had a very intimate knowledge of God and of his ways. They were conscious of his presence. They knew his purposes for their lives. They knew what God had commanded them to do. And we are told concerning Moses that he was faithful in all his house. Everything that God had commanded him to do, he did. See, Now then, I want to say this, that in the book of Revelation, we are told that those that follow the Lamb are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. Called, chosen, and faithful. And we want to consider what is our calling in life. What has God called us to do? Is it to be a teacher, grade school teacher, high school teacher, counselor? Is it to work in a certain factory and so forth? But we need to know what God's plan and purpose for us is. You see, even in secular work, it's important to appreciate that we are in a certain secular work by the will of God. And that secular work, God will use to teach us to form our character. Those people who are working alongside us will be used of God to indeed mold us, to instruct us, to test us, to try us, to at times be the faggots, if I could say that, the wood that is thrown on the fire to heat us, to mold us, to purify us. You see, God is great and God uses all things, see, with Moses, he used for 40 years instructions from the royal palace. He was brought up in all the wisdom of Egypt. God did not deprecate that wisdom. But God used that wisdom later on to enable Moses to govern some three million people. And you see, in the book of Isaiah, it's written also, that the farmer is instructed by God how to produce a crop. He says, all this cometh from the Lord and is marvelous in our sight. And we have to realize this, that our secular life is very important. God uses it to form our characters, to teach us, and indeed, to accomplish what he wants in our lives. I thank God for my early training in research. And has molded me and aligned my mind to search out matters. Because research basically goes to the roots. And in studying the word of God, you have to go to the law of first mention to appreciate what God is saying and doing and his ways and so I thank God for my secular training and so I want to say this you see that secular training should not be ignored but we pray that we are in the right job so that God can use it for our instruction but also there's our spiritual life whereby we must talk and speak of the works of God of his law and also we must not neglect, you know, uh, shall I say, assembling ourselves together in church, as some do. The Apostle Paul warns of that. Now then, I want to come back to Ezra, and what the king said to Ezra. And he said, you know, you've not only got the responsibility of 
teaching in the temple. But you've got the responsibility of seeing that the whole country is well run. And so this is what he says in chapter 7 and verse 25. After the wisdom that is in thine hand, you know, teach and set magistrates. Set magistrates. In other words, appoint under leaders to run the country. And you know, that is something that we have to understand too. That as we, you know, rise up in positions, we have responsibility of setting people in certain slots. And here is a very good rule of thumb. You know, when you're considering a person, is not only how they're performing the job that they're in at the moment, but do they have the abilities to be placed in a higher post? And that is how you determine whether you advance people or not. And so all this, you see, um, Ezra was enjoined by the king to set up a good infrastructure. And in a church, you have to have a good infrastructure. If you're in a fellowship with responsibilities of global like we have, I mean, we have to have good infrastructure in many countries of the world so that the work that God has given us to do will be fulfilled. We have to have infrastructure. Not everybody's a preacher. We have to have people who are expert in other uh, regions. You see, administration, accountancy and the like. And uh, in this uh, age in which we're living, those who are technically able to work computers and the like. Now then, he also says concerning these magistrates that they were to set up, that they were those that knew the law of God, and if they did not, they were to be taught knowledge. In other words, the people that you put in positions whether behind a camera or whatever, those people must also know the law of God because God can work through them then and produce the quality of work that you want from them. But if they don't, you are to teach them the word of God so that everybody in whatever circumstance of life they are in or whatever part they play in the church they are to be thoroughly instructed in the law of God. And, uh, in fact, you know, he goes on, and uh, then he says this, this is Ezra, in contemplating the responsibilities that he had, he uh, proclaimed a fast to inquire of the Lord to inquire of the Lord, to seek of him a right way for us. Now, this is so important. You know, in life, and the more responsibility you have, the more you situations you confront you. And you're confronted with a situation. Perhaps you're told by God to do something. Well, that isn't sufficient. You have got to do as Ezra did, to seek the Lord, to seek God to seek God, to inquire of him, to inquire of him, the right way to perform the task that he has ordained for you. That is so important. You see, it's not only sufficient to say, well, I know what God wants, but how to perform it, how to perform it, you see. And, And this applies to everything. You know, as I said, I was in research. And uh, in research, uh, it was actually telecommunication engineering. In research, we were constantly probing, seeking to find out the mysteries, shall I say, of nature that would uh, enable us to uh, advance in this area. And, um, you know, I learned a lot from... uh, the great people who had gone before. And uh, I found out that many of these people, the great inventors, were Christians. 
And they said it was 90% revelation. 90% Edison claimed revelation for the uh, incandescent lamp. And the point that I make is this, that before we went into that research lab and a friend of mine was Christian too, you know, one prayed and said, Lord, help us. Help us to go down the right channel. Help us to know how to face this challenge, you see. Lord, help us. Give us understanding. And it was amazing. You know what happened? God just spoke a word like that and it gave us the key to know how to solve one of the scientific problems we had. God was the source. And so you see, this little verse, you know, he proclaimed a fast to inquire of the Lord, to seek of him the right way for us, the right way for us, the right way to do things. And you know, you can apply that in the raising of children. How, Lord, should I raise my child? Show me how to raise it. Probably the Lord will say, choose your battles. You know, uh, don't fight every one sort of thing. You're going to lose some of them with your child. But anyway, <clears throat> how to raise. How to raise. You know, one mother asked the Lord how to handle one of her children. And he said, be gentle, but be firm. Be gentle, but be firm. And it gave her the key and enabled her to produce a very good daughter. Well, you see, these are the things that we need to understand. Now, there was a great problem that Ezra had, not only in setting forth all the magistrates and, you know, getting the infrastructure of the nation in order so that everything functioned, and teaching those people in authority the ways of God if they did not understand them, so that... <clears throat> Everybody was godly in every position that they had been placed in. But he had another problem. And that was the family. The family. And there had been some very unlawful marriages. In fact, they had married heathens. Well, he had to put a lot of things right in the family. And I want to say this, jumping to another prophet, Malachi, who was actually prophesying a few years after Ezra. Malachi speaks of the coming of Elijah before that terrible day of the Lord. And then he tells us specifically what the ministry of Elijah would address. And essentially he said it's family. He said it's turning the heart of the father to the son and the son to the father. In other words, he is foretelling a breakdown in family life in the last days, not only in the world, but in the church. And this is exactly what Ezra and later on Nehemiah had to face. They had to face a breakdown in family life. Now, I want to say this as one who had been married for 35 years and, you know, on my deathbed, uh, not on my deathbed, sorry, but on the deathbed of my wife, she said to uh, the nurse who said, she said, uh, you know, my, my husband and I have not had a quarrel for 35 years of marriage. And that was her, shall I say, uh, legacy because she was such a wonderful person to live with. But I'm saying this, the strength that I had for the ministry came from our relationship, our relationship. That relationship gave me such strength and enabled us together being formed as from two sticks, God made us one stick in his hand. Oh, what strength we had 
in facing the vicissitudes of life and the difficulties of the ministry. We were one. I would go back to her with my problems that I had to face. She would pray me through. She would help me with my sermon. She would help me in every aspect of life. There was my strength. There was my strength. A wonderful unity bonded in love with my wife. And you see, this is what we find in the Restoration Era. There was a collapse in the families and Nehemiah was having to address the same thing years later. And also Malachi is prophesying that the ministry of Elijah will be to the families in the last days. Now, in closing, I want to make an appeal to you as a husband, to you as a wife, to address family relationship, to make sure that you are united, to make sure that you are a threefold cord, the Lord, husband and wife, bound together. It cannot easily be broken. And in so doing, you'll experience such strength and in having your united family, you bring you unity to your church you bring strength to your church and you'll bring the restoration that God has promised to the church in the last days, a church without spot or wrinkle. But it starts in the family and may God help you by his grace to have that beautiful unity in your uh, family so that you bring that unity and that glory and presence of God into the church. God bless you.